Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Nick Robin, and uh, we have a great show today for you. But before, I just want to get into a little bit about my day. met up with uh, one of my girlfriends, a girl I've known for about four or five years now. And the funny thing about her is uh, we met during my senior year of college. She was like one of those girls. She went to University of Arizona you know, big, huge party school, had a little too much fun and decided that she wanted to possibly transfer to San Diego State. So she ended up going to Miramar College, one of the local community colleges by San Diego State. And she was one of those girls that didn't go to San Diego State, but come around for the party. So me, her, one of my other buddies, and then one of her friends, we kind of had a little uh, friendship going. We'd all hang out. I Kind of used to have a thing for her friend. Fortunately, that unfortunately that did not work out. But yeah, um, we were talking today just about our different upbringings, and it's funny because my mom had me at 37 years old, and her mom had her at 17. So just thinking about that, that's a 20 year difference. And we were just talking about how she used to be like kind of a party girl, and she's kind of settled down now. And uh, we were just sitting having uh, some board and brew, which is a local. Del Mar landmark, and uh, we were just catching up. We had a lovely day. We went on a little hike around my, or we walked some trails around my neighborhood, went on a little run. We played some tennis, and then ended it with some sandwiches, went out, laid out at the beach, typical San Diego life there. As always, it's a perfect 75, and uh, it's just, um, I don't know, during this time, it's nice to just hang out, just uh, catching up with some people that you really haven't caught up with over the years. And like with me living in San Francisco, just moving back here to San Diego, it's given me that opportunity. But enough about my life. Let's move on to today's show. And I will be discussing Giannis's playoff expectations and what it will mean if he does not win the finals in terms of his contract extension. Then I'm going to be going off of Austin Rivers' recent comments, and I'll analyze all the legitimate title contenders. And then on Nick's picks, I'll look at the most outlandish basketball movie scenes in recent memory. But first, we'll be breaking down ESPN's top 50 player power rankings going into Orlando. So I was looking at this list yesterday, and I started by first kind of mapping out. So it's the 50 players that will have the biggest impact once the Orlando restart begins. So I looked at first how many players were represented by each team. So remember, there's 22 teams here, not 30 teams. And what we have is the Celtics actually had the most players. They had five rep representatives from their team in the top 50. Pretty impressive. I mean, that's basically five divided by 50. They're looking at a tenth of all the players. So they have 10% of the top 50 players in the NBA right now. And that includes Marcus Smart, Gordon Hayward, and then in the top 25, Jalen Brown, who I was kind of shocked to see, Kemba Walker, and Jason Tatum marked in at 13. Next up was the Clippers with Lou Williams, Montrezl Harrell, Paul George, and of course Kawhi Leonard. Bucks also had four, Lopez, Bledsoe, Middleton, Giannis, Raptors, Gasol, Fred Van Fleet, Kyle Lowry, Pascal Siakam. 
And then the Thunder, that was, that's the big surprise there. The Thunder had four representatives. Dennis Schroeder, who has had an unbelievable season after kind of shitting the bed last year due to, I mean, when you play with Westbrook, you don't get the, it's just not the same. You're sitting in the corner, he dribbles around for 20 seconds, then when he doesn't decide to score at the rim or shoot a three, he'll give it to you for the last four seconds and you have to shoot it. So not the best offense to build your career around. And then they also, moving moving back to the Thunder, four representatives, Dennis Schroeder, Gallinari, SGA, as in Shy Gilgis Alexander, and of course, Chris Paul, who came in at 16th. Not too bad for a 6'1 point guard in his 15th season. And then one of the biggest surprises, the Lakers only have two players in the top 50, but those two players are also in the top five. James came in at the number one spot. Davis came in at five. So looking at this list, I picked out who I thought was probably the most overrated player by ranking. And just looking at the list, they have James Harden in at number four. And you're going to start by saying, Nick, he leads the league in scoring. He led the league in scoring last year. He won an MVP two years ago. The guy is all time. But... Let's just take a look at his playoff failures. Starting back in 2015, he was benched in the elimination game against the Clippers. Josh Schmidt, Corey Brewer, and Dwight Howard had to save his ass. Ends the next series versus the Dubs with a playoff record 13 turnovers. So yeah, they play the Clippers, they're down uh, 3-1, and they come back, win the series. They're down in one of the last games, they come back, win the series, and then go on to the dubs. They get blown out. They lose 4-1. to one. And then in the fifth game, five, he has a playoff record 13 turnovers. So it he's already giving us a low bar to start with. But it gets even worse. 2016, he loses to the dubs again. Again, 4-1. Curry does not play in games 2, 3, and 5. They lose game 5 by 33 points. So they're just getting blown off the floor. And this is, again, yes, they went 73-9, and nine, but they were missing their two-time MVP, Steph Curry, who we all know went on in 2016 to win unanimously. Now rolling up 2017. In the final game of the series against the Spurs, they lose by 39 points. 39 points without Kawhi Leonard, arguably a top-five player in the NBA that season, and their starting point guard, Tony Parker. Harden has... Three times as many turnovers, six as made field goals, two. So 2015, 2016, 2017, moving on to 2018, and probably the most detrimental one. They blow a 3-2 series lead to the Dubs in the Western Conference Finals. For the entire series, Harden shoots 24% from three, and at one point is 0 for 22 from three. And then next and last season... He plays a little bit better. They only go six games, though. But their rank goes down in game five while the series is tied 2-2, giving them an opening. This is, I remember being there and being like, there's no way the Rockets have the series now. They're going to win game five. They're going to win game six at home. And they're going to finally get past the Warriors. The Warriors are over. Their dynasty is done. Durant's going to leave in free agency, which he did despite them making the finals. and But no, that doesn't happen. Harden loses game five, loses game six at home. In game six, he shoots a respectable 11 of 25 from the field, but only 7 of 12 from the free throw line. It's his third worst free throw percentage game of the entire season. And to put this in perspective, he missed five free throws that game. He missed only 11 in the entire series. So in the other five games combined, he missed six free throws. He missed five in game six. Talk about a choke job there. So his playoff failures, yes, I know right now James Harden is playing at an unbelievable level as he has for several years now, but it's kind of like that girl. James Harden is like, James Harden and winning an NBA Finals is like that girl from high school that you were always in the friend zone with, but she, you always had the biggest crush on her and you go away, you guys both go away to college, and every year you come back from college and something's different. You either got a new haircut, you lost that 20 pounds of fat from freshman year, you got a new Beamer, and you're just 
every summer you come back, you come back and you're like, this is the, this is the year. This is the summer that I finally tell her how I feel. And we go off happily ever after in the sunset. And that is James Harden when it comes to winning the NBA championship. Every year he plays excellent in the regular season and the critics are like, it's time. He's going to get it. He's going to get to the finals. He's going to win the finals finally. But no, every year he does something to blow it. Just like that girl from high school that you can't seem, you just can't seem to get. She's, she comes back freshman year summer. She's got that new freshman year boyfriend. Second year, you come back. She's studying abroad in Barcelona. Junior year, you think you're ready. And she is dating some Instagram influencer. You just can't seem to win. Something always seems to slip up when you seem like you're that close to getting what you want. The rug gets pulled right underneath you. And that's James Harden right there. And now looking at his regular season stats, I look at the inflated scoring statistics. He averages 12.6 threes a game. That's first. Almost more than three. He almost attempts three more than the next closest player, Lillard. And not only does he average 12.6 threes per game, he's only shooting 35.6% from behind the arc this year. That rates a hun- that ranks 111th in the NBA, right ahead of Kelly Oubre and right behind Bradley Beal, who's an excellent scorer in his own right, but just shows you that his the scoring's a little inflated. And then look at his free throws. And I'm one to say that free throws are a skill. Like, you have to be skilled to be able to get that many calls and that many whistles and to draw contact. But he also leads free throw, uh, leads the league in free throw attempts almost two more than the next closest player. So it just shows that a lot of his numbers are just him shooting a ton of threes, being able to get his scoring average up, and then creating contact and getting to the free throw line. But at, in terms of him being a great scorer, he's more just a volume scorer who takes more threes than anybody else in the NBA by far. LeBron almost is, I believe, is shooting better than Lillard or than Harden is this year from behind the arc. So 111. Just think about that. There's only, let's just say, 10 players that get minutes per team. That's 300 players. So he's in like the 60-ish percentile when it comes to three three point percentage, but his attempts is in the 99 percentile. So it needs to get a little bit. He needs to get that 60-ish percentile close to that 99 percentile. And so the verdict is, he's a proven regular season success. He has proven his regular season success, winning the MVP in 18. He finished in the top five in 14, 15, 17, and 19, including second place finishes in 14, 17, and 19. Sorry, 14, 15, and 19. So the guy has finished top three in MVP voting four years, including the year he won it. But with all these playoff failures, I just can't put him high. I can't put him in my in the top five most important players in Orlando. There's just guys that I think have had better seasons, people that are even more important to their team than Harden is. And um, I want to do an era comparison here because I feel like I haven't done many analogies or similes when it comes to the league. James Harden is basically a modern-day Jerry West. Jerry West, though, at least made the finals, but that was when there was 10 to 12 teams running around the league. Now we have 30. So during his time in the NBA, he made nine finals appearances going one and eight in the finals. So yes, he made it to the finals, but there were less teams, but they were both excellent, excellent scorers and also above average passers from the two position. West averaging 6.7 for his career, and Harden right below that at 6.3. But we've seen over the last several years, as he's taken on more point guard duties, his assist numbers are have gone have risen exponentially. Now, turning the page, well, actually, these are the players that should be ranked ahead of Harden. Anthony Davis at 5 and Luka Doncic at 7. Luka Doncic has played at an unbelievable level this year. He's being compared to a young LeBron James. He even is having a better year 20 season than LeBron did. And that's saying a lot because, I mean, LeBron is a top two, three, four player in NBA history. And Luka Doncic at age 20 is doing things that no one else has ever done at his age. 
Now, moving on to the most underrated player by ranking, and I have two Pelicans for you. And this guy, I think it's talked up a lot when it comes to most underrated player, and that's Drew Holiday. Over the last three years, Drew Holiday has averaged 20 points per game, four and a half rebounds, 6.8 assists, and has shot 47.5% from the field, and a modest, almost NBA average, 34% from three. Not only that, though, he's played awesome defense, claiming a first-team all-defense in 2017-18 and a a second all-defensive team last year. Not only that, he outplayed Lillard and C.J. McCollum in the 2018 playoffs. Drew Holiday, forgot to mention, he's ranked 26 on the list. 26 on the list. So that means Jalen Brown's ahead of them. Kemba Walker's ahead of them. Jason Tatum's ahead of them. That's three different Celtics players that are ahead of Drew Holiday. Not saying he's better than Tatum, but I'd say I'd probably put him ahead of a Jalen Brown who has improved drastically this year, but I don't think he's done the same things or shown the same type of defensive prowess as well as able to handle an offense as someone like Drew Holiday has. Drew Holiday, yes, his own Zion Williams and his own teammate is ahead of him at 23, who's played, what, 15, 18 NBA games? But I just feel like Drew Holiday is someone who always gets the wrong end of the stick. And I would say he's right outside that top five point guards in the NBA, and he should be somewhere in that 7 to 10 range, which I think definitely puts him with in the top 20 in the NBA, top 20 player in the NBA conversation. Now, another Pelican who was wrongfully underrated in these rankings, Brandon Ingram, came in at number 47. Not only is he one of the most important players on the Pelicans, he's one of the most untradeable players in the NBA at only 24 years old. Looking at the progress he's made from 1819 to 1920 on nearly identical minutes per game is crazy. Just And this is another example of playing with a superstar or a ball dominant guard like LeBron James, where it kind of, it it's hard for players to sometimes become comfortable when the ball isn't in their hands at all times. They're still on the court, but they don't get as many touches because a guy like LeBron, a guy like Russell Westbrook, they have high usage ratings. I would say LeBron does a better job at involving his teammates than Russell Westbrook, but that's something to discuss later. But looking at his numbers, Brandon Ingram has increased in every major, major statistical category, rebounds, assists, field goal percentage, uh, points per game, you name it. And his last year he averaged 33.8 minutes a game. This year he's only average, he's averaging 34.3. So he's only gone up a smidge in the amount of points per game. And this is a perfect example of new situation, better results. You come into a new situation, you have more leeway here than he did with the Lakers, who LeBron, everything goes to LeBron. Here, and I think it helped that Zion was out for a little bit. So that gave Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, and Drew Holiday a little more time to mesh together. And it's proven, just looking at the numbers, he's increased his shots by four. He's increased by four shots per game. And his three-point percentage has increased, has gone up by 5.7% to nearly 39%, which is well above the NBA average. And Again, this is a guy who's 6'10", 6'11", Durant-type body. And at 24 has, I think, he's improved drastically from last season. I think people were starting to say that he wasn't going to be what we thought he was going to be, which is a Durant double-ganger. But I think he's well on his way. And the funniest part is his free-throw percentage. He's shot more attempts than he had last year, but has increased his free throw percentage from 67.5% to 85.8%. So Brooke Lopez is ahead of him at 45. Robert Covington is ahead of him at 44. Not saying those aren't great players, but I think Brandon Ingram is can be more impactful for his team. Again, he is one of the most valuable players under 25 and is only getting better game by game. His next big test, though, the playoffs. If he can perform there, then I think he'll shoot up any kind of list like this. Because, I mean, again, it all matters what you do in the playoffs. And now let's take a look at the top five players. And with number five, we have Anthony Davis. Number four, as I mentioned, James Harden, who I think should be a little bit higher up on this list. Number three, 
Kawhi Leonard, the reigning finals MVP. Number two, the Greek freak. And number one, LeBron. And this is the problem I have with the top five. First off, Kawhi won finals MVP last year after nearly taking an entire season off. As we remember, he hurt himself, his knee, didn't trust the Spurs, uh, doctors, sat out nearly all of last year, played in nine games or the year before, ends up getting traded to Toronto, whole new town, whole new team, whole new culture, comes in, leads him to the championship in his first year almost, and he was, unlike these super teams that we see these days, Hawaii is just one guy on a team with other solid contributors. He doesn't have the Miami Heat Big Three or the Golden State Durant, Curry, Draymond, Clay Thompson four-headed monster, and he doesn't have the culture that the Spurs have with Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, and I guess Kawhi, who was on those teams, but he came to a team all by himself, him, Danny Green in the trade, and yeah, brings him the title, always being the one to get those shots in at crunch time, he should still be number one on this list. I don't care about the games he takes off. He's the champ until he ain't the champ no more. End. Period. And yeah, I agree. Moving on to my next point, LeBron should be higher on this list. Yes, LeBron is amazing. He's in year 17. He's played at an unbelievable level, but his numbers in some areas, field goal percentage, three-point percentage, are a little bit down. His assist numbers, of course, as many experts have talked about all season long, are at a career high. But I think he still needs to be third. He has to be behind Giannis, who's last year's MVP winner and is looking to repeat, and then Kawhi, who last year's 2019 Finals MVP. So I don't know how you have the LeBron. Yes, LeBron's been great in the regular season, but we have to remember last year, they didn't even make the playoffs. So I guess in terms of what this list is talking about, it's the most important players in the bubble, but it was still a power ranking. I'd have to put Kawhi and Giannis ahead of LeBron. And lastly, Doncic, Luka Doncic, I've already spoken on it earlier. He needs to crack the top five. He is, he's been a top five player all season long and has led a surprising Dallas team. They're the seven seed right now, but they could easily finish in that three, four, five in the middle of the Western Conference, which is like it is every year for the last several seasons. It's the best conference in the NBA. And this guy, again, I've said it number, uh, numerous times. He's 20 years old. Chris Tapsforsingas has picked up his game as of late before the season had to stop due to COVID. But Doncic has been the number one player on that team all season long and has led them to one of the best point differentials in the entire NBA outside of the Bucks, Lakers, and Clippers. So definitely something to note there. That's enough for right now. We just broke down ESPN's top 50 player rankings heading into Orlando. After this commercial break, I will be looking at Giannis's playoff expectations, expectations and what happens if they don't win the finals. More on that right after this break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Ante Kakumpa. Ante Kakumpa? Hmm. Not sure if that's right, but 
let's just call him Greek Freak. So, the best player in the NBA. Sorry, LeBron. Sorry, Kawhi. But it's Giannis's time. Back to back MVP winner. Not yet, but I'm going to say it that more than likely he will win his second consecutive MVP. And honestly, as much, the only thing LeBron has on him that will allow LeBron to win MVP over Giannis is number one. He's 35 years old. He's been doing this 17 years and he's won four MVPs. But in my opinion, I think he should have more. Secondly, Lakers don't make the playoffs this year, or sorry, last year, but now have the best record in the NBA. Yes, they did get Anthony Davis, but LeBron has taken over the point guard duties in his 17th year in the NBA, leading the assist, showing you that an old dog can learn new tricks. And he has the how the team performs with him on and off the court in his favor, because I think without, without... To be honest, the Bucs are still a playoff team, especially in the Eastern Conference. Without LeBron, this team is barely an eighth seed. Yes, Anthony Davis is amazing, but he's we've seen him in New Orleans for the last several years, and he made the playoffs once, maybe twice, losing to the Warriors that one year, and then beating the Portland Trailblazers the year after. So Giannis is going to win the MVP again. I think there is no reason he leads LeBron in every major statistical core category outside of assists. So let's look at the playoff picture. What if the Bucks win the finals? What does that mean? First off, it will be the first title nearly half a century for the Bucks. The last time they won a title, they had Kareem and the Big O, and that was the 1970-71 season, so nearly 50 years ago. If they win, Giannis will be one of the youngest players to be the best player on a title team. Yes, Magic Johnson won it in 1980. He won finals MVP, but he was technically the second best player on that team. Green was still in the midst of his prime. 2015, Steph Curry, 25 years old. Dwayne Wade, 2006. But unsure of whether he or Shaq were the best player, but he did win the MVP. So Giannis would be in the conversation for youngest player to win a championship being the best player on that team. Michael Jordan was 28. LeBron was 28, 29. So it's a big deal if he wins the title this year. And as we've seen, no player has ever left a team after winning the finals. Well, except Kawhi Leonard last year. But Kawhi Leonard is in a whole other conversation of just human beings. The guy is, in a, he's the Terminator. He is an assassin. Great, would make a great poker player as well. I would not want to go up against Kawhi playing poker. So let's look at the other scenario. What if the Bucks do not win the finals? Giannis still has one year left on his contract, but he, the Bucks will have the ability to offer him the Supermax extension. Let's start with that. What is the Supermax extension? It's officially known as the Designated Veteran Player Extension. This rule allows teams to re-sign Qualified players to maximum five-year contracts worth up to 35% of the salary cap with 8% escalation in each subsequent year. So this rule was made basically to help low to mid-market teams. Sorry, small to mid-market teams. So let's go on. next, question number two. Who is eligible for the Supermax? So again, it can only be offered by the team that drafted the player or traded for his rookie contract. So again, benefiting the small to mid-market teams. They also have to meet a special criteria, one of the following. So they either need to be named to an all-NBA team in the most recent season or both seasons before that most recent season, or be named NBA Defensive Player of the Year in the most recent season or both seasons before it, or be named NBA MVP in any of the previous Three seasons. So, Giannis winning MVP last year would qualify him for the Supermax extension. And this is where it gets a little confusing. Due to COVID, the NBA has lost over a billion dollars in revenue due to, of course, COVID, ticket sales, lack of ticket sales next year because we don't know if fans will be able to come to the arenas next year. And due to the China altercation back in October, which Feels like a century ago at this point because, I mean, yeah, it's almost been a year since that scenario. Since we're almost in, we're in mid 
to late July now, and the season still hasn't restarted. So it's undetermined what the salary cap is going to be. Last year, it was $109 million. The cap was projected to go up to $125 million this year, but as I just pointed out, they're losing, the league will lose over a billion dollars in revenue due to COVID, ticket sales, and the China altercation. So let's look at it from a couple different um, examples. Let's start with if the cap does rise to $125 million, what the contract will look for Giannis and the Bucks. So he will make $43.8 million in 2021-2022. The new team, if he chooses to go to another team, will make $37.5 million. Next year, it will go up 8% to $47.3 million in the year 2022-23. With the new team, it will be 39.4. Next season, 50.8 with Milwaukee. 54.3. So basically the total contract, the Supermax extension at the 125, $125 million salary cap is five years worth $253.8 million. So that would be the Bucks offer. Milwaukee, or any team that is not named Milwaukee, will be able to sign Giannis to a four-year $161.3 million contract. So we're talking about a good chunk of money, basically over 25 to 30% more. We're looking at about Almost $90 million, about $90 million left on the table if he decides to go with another team. And there's been rumors that he might, that he could get traded to the Warriors, which honestly is crazier than even Durant signing there back in 16. So we're talking $90 million Giannis could leave on the table if he wants to go to another team. Now let's look at the Supermax at $118 million salary cap. And here we're looking at about $240 million for Milwaukee and $152 million for any team, not the Milwaukee Bucks. So again, we're looking at about $80 million guaranteed money that he would be leaving on the table. That's a lot of money. And from what we've seen, Giannis doesn't seem like the typical superstar that would ever leave, but we've seen players who in their early years, when they're maybe a little more naive to everything going on in this business, because that's what it is, it's a business, We've seen Durant say he wants to stay in OKC for life. We've seen LeBron, and honestly, we don't even know what was going on with LeBron. I, I feel like we can never actually pinpoint what he was thinking during his time in Cleveland. Yeah, we thought, I thought, that, what the fuck did I know? I thought he was going to stay, but he left for greener pastures, went to Miami. Durant left, went to the Warriors. So we've seen players say they want to commit to teams that end up leaving anyways. Again, Giannis could be different, but the the more years he grows and if he doesn't get to the finals or win the finals, he knows that this is a league that really puts a lot of emphasis on titles and rings. And if he's not winning any, he's going to go someplace where he can win. But let's look at the advantages for the Bucks. Only team that can offer a starting salary of 35% of the cap for five years. So that gives them a big advantage right there. Negative, though, is another team could close the gap by telling Giannis that they'll re-sign him for another max deal when he's eligible in the year 2025-26. So he could take the four-year contract with another team and then get the max five-year deal once he hits the 10-year the ten year NBA veteran deal. Another advantage is the Bucks have the best record in the NBA and a roster that is built for sustainable success. Just look at the – they have Chris Middleton – they have Eric Bledsoe on what is now a bargain contract getting paid $18 million a year. They have Brooke Lopez. They have one of the best defenses in the NBA. They have an up-and-coming coach in Buttonhoser. So they do have a lot of things in their advantage, in their wheelhouse, that a team like New Orleans didn't have with Anthony Davis. They did not have that same luxury last year. And New Orleans had not done a good job of putting a team around Anthony Davis how the Bucks have done with Giannis. For example, last year, they let Malcolm Brogdon walk. They weren't willing to pay him because they needed. They thought they could use that money more strategically, for example, offering this Supermax extension to Giannis. Who are you going to keep? Malcolm Brogdon? Yes, great player. Maybe play for uh, all league one day, top 15 player in the league. Or are you taking Giannis, the number one player in the NBA? Giannis is going to win every time. So let's now look if Giannis passes on the Supermax extension. So he says no. He has one year left on his contract. He 
plays that one year out, or the Bucks trade him, would you take the reigning MVP for one season, knowing that you could lose him for nothing in free agency the following year? After what we saw last year with Kawhi and Toronto, I think most teams would say yes. Because the whole point is you're trying to win a championship. And if you can have Giannis for one year, that gives you the best possible chance at winning a championship. But enough about this upcoming fall and what may or may not happen. We still need to get through the first summer of NBA basketball. And I've said this on the show so many times, I can't wait. And I know all of this, all of the country is anticipating this as well. Because again, this is unprecedented times. We've never seen an NBA championship played for in September, October. So that's going to be interesting in its own self. No fans. What's going to happen? How are players going to react to this? Is it going to take the pressure off that there aren't fans there? I mean, probably 20,000 screaming fans. That's a whole lot of pressure there. But at the same time, is this going to take away from the adrenaline, the rush that these players get when they play in front of a packed crowd? How is LeBron going to react when he's dribbling down the court? There's 15 seconds on the clock. It's a tied game or they're down. Is that going to help him make the shot? Is it going to, like, some, someone could scream, there could be 50 people in the arena and he could hear any sound that anyone makes. Could be a huge distraction. Who knows? But enough about this. We're moving on. After this commercial break, we'll be going into Austin Rivers' comments. He thinks the Houston Rockets are one of only three or four teams that have a chance at the title. What do you think? Well, you're about to hear what I think. So stay tuned. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back. So we just looked into the hypotheticals of Giannis and what's going to happen with the Supermax if they don't win the finals or at least get to the finals. Will he be traded to the Warriors? This and that. But just hypotheticals. So we're now getting into some real basketball because the season is two weeks away. And we are talking about who are the real contenders in the NBA to win the finals in this once in a lifetime Orlando bubble that we are about to embark on. And let's start with Austin Rivers' comments from earlier this week saying there are only three or four teams that can win the title and the Rockets are one of them. So yes, you do need to have confidence in your team. The Rockets are somewhat of a title contender. They do have two of the best 15 players in the NBA in James Harden and Russell Westbrook who have honestly played together a lot better than most people expected, even better than Chris Paul and James Harden played together in the first experiment over the last couple of seasons. Westbrook and Harden have been even better thanks to Westbrook finally fixing his goddamn shot selection. How hard is it? I mean, these guys have egos. How hard is it just not to shoot threes? You're not good at threes. Don't shoot them. Unless you're wide open. You're a career 32% three-point shooter. You're not a good three-point shooter. Take the shots that you're actually good at. It's simple. But sometimes the adrenaline starts rushing and you just want to jack up some threes. Don't. 
So yes, the Rockets are definitely a title contender, but there are way more than just three or four. And we are going to look at seven. I Yes, seven title contenders. Three in the West and surprisingly four in the East. Quickly, those are the Lakers, Clippers, Rockets, Bucks, Raptors, Celtics, and lastly, the Heat. So let's look at what each of these teams has going for them. So starting with the Lakers, best record in the Western Conference. Sorry, earlier in the show, I said they have the best record in the NBA. Eat. That is incorrect. The Bucks have the best record. Lakers have the best record in the Western Conference. So they're currently the one seed. As everyone knows, they got two of the best two of the best five players in the league on their team, James Anthony Davis. LeBron has been playing at an MVP level all year long. He's been incredible. We can't say it enough. It is unbelievable. We are watching a once in a generation type of talent. So they're good there. LeBron, AD, solid. Dwight Howard, it's been great this year as well. But what we're worried about is, can other players make shots? J.R. Smith, Dion Waiters, Kyle Kuzma. These guys are going to get open looks thanks to all the attention that's going to be put on Davis. And, of course, LeBron, when he gets double teamed, he knows who to find. But are these players going to make shots? That's the biggest question mark there. Moving on to the L.A. Clippers, the team within their own building and probably the biggest threat for LeBron's chance to win a fourth title. Similar to the Lakers, they have two of the best players in the NBA, and not just two of the best players, two of the best two-way players, which honestly just means you're the... I, I hate how like, we say two-way... If you're the best two-way player, you're probably one of the best players in the NBA. But yes, these two guys play both offense and defense, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George. They haven't been able to play as much together as we would have liked to seen, but when they are on the court, they are very good. Rarely losing. So and unlike unlike the Lakers though, they have one of the most balanced teams. Montrez Harrell, Lou William form a great pick and roll duo. Kawhi PG thirteen, Zubok, great young center, Landry Shamit, three point sniper, Marcus Morris Senior. So they have a ton of options on the bench. Reggie Jackson's another guard that can that might be playing a pivotal role, could be an X factor going to the playoffs. So very balanced team, unlike the Lakers. So that's why I'm giving them, I would say they are ahead of the Lakers. And then they also won two the first two matchups, losing the third. So they played very well, especially when it's counted. And I forgot to mention Pat Beverly, one of one of the feistiest players in the NBA. The big question is, will PG, Paul George, finally perform in the postseason? Outside of making the Eastern Conference Finals when he was in Indiana, he hasn't shown as much playoff success as we would have anticipated from a guy who's been called a top 10 and at times a top 5 player in the NBA, finishing third in MVP voting last year. But can he perform on the biggest stage? That is yet to be seen. But they do have the reigning Finals MVP in Kawhi Leonard, who, along with LeBron James, is trying to become the first players, first player in NBA history to win a title, to win finals MVP with three separate teams. Now, the Rockets. So we've gone into it. They have the NBA leading scorer in Harden. And Westbrook has done a great job of adjusting his game, especially over the last couple months of the season. But honestly, they don't have much outside of that. Robert Covington is a huge plus at the five. Eric Gordon hasn't played up to his normal level this season. And Daniel House is one of their first guys off the bench. So they're very they're very top-heavy, similar to the Lakers, but I would say they have even less depth than the Lakers, which is saying a lot. And what we need to see from them, can this small ball lineup succeed in the playoffs? And can these two players, Harden and Westbrook, conquer their playoff demons? As I spoke about earlier in the podcast, Harden has been horrific in the playoffs. Now, the Bucks. We spoke about them in the last segment. They have the best record and the best player in the NBA. A stout defense this year, but will Giannis have enough help around him? Can Bledsoe show up? Can Chris Middleton show up? Will Brooke Lopez still be, play at the same level he's been playing at all season in the playoffs? That's their biggest weakness. Can the other players around Giannis 
step up and perform at the level they have been playing at all season in the regular season? Can they do that in the playoffs? Now, the next team that I find very interesting, the Toronto Raptors, the defending champions, whose core players have only improved this year. Fred Van Fleet has taken his game to another level. One of the lead leaders in assists. Pascal Siakam taking his game to another level. OJ Ananobi has improved from last year as well. Marcus has taken a, I would say, a hit down. I mean, he's 35, 30, 34, 35 years old. He's old. A big guy like that, he has a lot to carry around. OJ Ananobi, though, has taken over Kawhi's defensive assignments, and Kyle Lowry has been steady as he has been throughout his tenure in Toronto. But who's going to take over for Kawhi in crunch time? Will B. Siakam, is he able to go another level? Is he able to make the big shots when they count down the line as Kawhi was able to do last year? That is going to determine whether this team gets burnt out in the second round or somehow makes it back to the finals. Now we look at one of the most historic franchises in NBA history, the Boston Celtics, who after Kyrie leaving in, um, leaving free agency, he has played or our new balance scoring threats with Walker, Kemba Walker, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Gordon Hayward had played have all played at a near all star level. They might have one of the deepest teams in the Eastern Conference, and they have a, a very underrated coach in Brad Stevens, who I think over the years we kind of took him for granted, but I think he now has the personnel around him to really have a shot at winning the title, or at least getting over the hump to the finals. But can Jason Tatum step up like he did in a rookie in the playoffs? Last year, he was he took a he took um he took a couple steps backwards from his great rookie season. It could have been a pairing with Kyrie Irving. He has played remarkably better this season. ESPN did rank him 13th best player going into Orlando. So that is huge for a guy who is only 21 years old. So do the Celtics, can Tatum step up like he did, how he dunked over Le- LeBron in the 2018 Eastern Conference Finals? Can he bring back some of that magic? And lastly, my personal favorite team in the NBA and who has the baddest motherfucker in the NBA, and I'm talking about Jimmy Butler in the Miami Heat. This guy is a fucking savage. The way he went after the Timberwolves last year, calling them out because, hey, he knows he ain't the most talented player, but he's going to work his fucking ass off and work out these other guys and be tougher than these other guys and Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins. This guy is a bad motherfucker, and I love to see him playing at a top 10 level all year in the NBA. It's going to make the second team. Not, maybe even the first. Who knows? Because he's led a underrated Heat team into the middle of the pack of the Eastern Conference. And could end up in that three or four seed. So we'll see. The thing I like about the Heat is they have the only player in the league in Sam Adebayo who can guard Giannis. That is huge. Once you get into the playoffs to have a guy like at a bio who can guard multiple positions. It's an excellent passer at the five is priceless. So they can guard, they have someone who can guard Giannis and then they got Jimmy Butler who can guard almost anyone else. And then they have the secret that you need once you get out of the East, which is LeBron stoppers. They got Andre Iguodala who famously won finals MVP for his work of slowing. And I have slowing in quotation marks, slowing down LeBron. They have Adebayo, another big body they can throw at him in. And Jay Crowder, who, with this time with the Celtics, did not have much success, but he is 6'7", 6'8", built like a bulldozer. So they do have some guys they can throw at LeBron. So that's good if and once they make it out of the Eastern Conference. They have the personnel to go after LeBron and possibly slow him down. But the question is, who will be trusted to score outside of Butler? Out of bio keeps on getting better each day. But Tyler Hero has the most fourth quarter points. Sorry, the third most fourth quarter points 
after Drogic and Butler. So he might be an X factor later on in the playoffs. And then Goran Drogic is another guy who could step up and score, but that's the problem. Do they have enough offense to compete with teams like the Bucks, like the Celtics, like the Lakers or the Clippers who they could face in the finals? So we'll find that out. Find all of this out and more in the next couple of weeks. So that's my seven contenders for you. Lakers, Clippers, Rockets out of the West, and the Bucks, Raptors, Celtics, and Heat in the East. Now I'm going to look at a couple teams that are on the contenders or pretenders in the middle, and that is the Denver Nuggets, Dallas Mavericks, and the 76ers. So the Nuggets, they have Jokic, who's a top 10 player in the NBA. He's looking very skinny, but he did... <laughs> yes, skinny. I love how that's something that we... That analysts talk about like it's this big deal when a player loses weight. They're saying the same stuff about mellow, calling him skinny mellow now instead of hoodie mellow. So yeah, physique is a big deal in sports like the NBA, but just because you have a good body doesn't mean you're going to ball out. So the Nuggets, their lack of playoff success and experience is a little shaky. That's why I put them more in my pretender than actual contender list. The Mavericks, they have, they're very young, but they got young studs. Doncic, as I mentioned numerous times, has, has been a top five player in the league all season long. And Chris Tapps, what we need to find out about Chris Tapps, is he going to pick up from where he left off after um, the restart? So big question mark there. And then lastly, the 76ers, who arguably have one of the best starting fives in the NBA with Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Al Hortford, Richardson, and Tobias Harris. So if you look at any other team in the league, I no one, not many teams can beat that starting five. So, but they have been very unreliable and they lack three-point shooting, which as we all know in today's NBA, you need three-point shooting to win games. It's just a fact at this point, which is funny because 10 years ago, we Charles Barkley said that a jump shooting team would never win an NBA championship. And how wrong was he? He's still on TV making the big bucks, even though he was very wrong and has been wrong on several other occasions. But what we also need to see is what are we going to find from Joel and Ben and Ben Simmons? We've seen them produce at a high level, but then we've seen them falter at times, especially Ben Simmons. He comes out in, in last year's playoffs, gets totally embarrassed, then gets called out by Jared Dudley and goes off in the next game. And we think he solved it, but then... The Sixers end up losing in the next series. So in a tragic seven-game series where they did lose on a buzzer beater to the defending champs in their defense in Toronto and Kauai. But what are we going to see from Joel B down the road? What are we going to see from Ben Simmons? Can they step up? Can they put on their big boy pants and bring Philly a championship? And again... We only have 13, sorry, 12 days until we can have some of these questions answered. So we just went into it, wrapping up contenders for the 2020 NBA title. And after this break, we're going into Knicks picks. And we are looking at most outlandish basketball scenes throughout the years. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a nice stroll down memory lane. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast.
And we're back with you now for everyone's favorite segment, Nick's Picks, where I break down today the most outlandish basketball movie scenes in recent memory. So let's start. I mean, there's so many classic basketball movies, Coach Carter, Glory Road, Hoosiers, Blue Chips, the list goes on and on. But today we're going to more discuss and go down the list of the most outlandish basketball movie scenes. So we're looking at more of the John Tucker Must Die, Like Mike's, and so forth, the ridiculous basketball movies that we, as unrealistic and absurd as they are, we still love and cherish just as much as the classics. So skipping honorable mentions today, because, I mean, finding so many different outlandish basketball movie scenes was kind of tougher than I expected. Uh, it's not really something you can, t- I mean, it is something you can type into Google, but they don't, it's mostly just overall sports movies, doesn't really give you basketball only, but I found a good top five, and beginning with Like Mike, and I'm talking about Little Bow Wow's Dunks. First off, so for any of you that don't know what Like Mike is about, uh, Little Bow Wow plays a 14-year-old kid, finds a pair of shoes with the initials MJ for Michael Jordan, could be Michael Jackson. And all of a sudden, he now balls like a superstar. So that movie concept alone makes this list absurd. So the kid's 14 years old. He goes to an L.A. Knights game. There's no such thing as the L.A. Lakers in this movie, although they do make a reference to the Lakers. So maybe the Knights have taken over for the Clippers. Who knows? So he's on the court at halftime, and he basically looks like he was shot out of a launcher because he dunks from basically the free throw line. It's the most unrealistic dunk you'll ever see in a movie. And uh, <clears throat> that's one example. And then whenever he's going in transition, going past opponents, he's you can tell he's carrying the ball. And to top it all off, Little Bow Wow is five feet. So there's no way a, a guy who's five foot and 14 years old is dunking on a 10 foot rim. So that's number five for you. Number four, and one of my personal favorite good, bad movies, John Tucker Must Die. And there's not one scene in particular, but all of it. The entire movie. For example, at one point, John Tucker is having a conversation with Brittany Snow's character, who's trying to ask out. And he's basically holding off a defender, dribbling the ball in his right hand, and having a full-on conversation, which never happens in real life or in a movie. And he gets the answer to get the, that he has a yes for the date, and he all of a sudden turns around and hits a game-winning shot probably 35-plus feet from the basket. So that's one example. And then the guy who plays Sean Tucker Must Die, Jesse Metcalf, is 5'10", and doing ridiculous backflips. As you'll see, um, there is a scene in the movie where all the basketball players start wearing thongs because... It gives them more flexibility, and they're very breezy. And you see him doing a full-on backflip dunk. And again, the guy's 5'10". I don't think anyone in the world can do a backflip dunk, unless they're using a trampoline, of course. So, number four, John Tucker Must Die. Moving on, number three. And probably one of the most unnecessary scenes, I think, in a superhero movie. And that's in The Amazing Spider-Man. Peter Parker, Andrew Garfield, that guy from Social Network, dunks over... Flash Thompson. So let's begin with Andrew Garfield's outfit. He's wearing jeans and a green drench coat. Anyone who's worn jeans and played has played basketball. There's not much flex. There's not much flexibility there to really move around when you're wearing jeans. And then let's look at the dunk itself. He doesn't dribble. He charges right through Flash. Travel much, and when he jumps up. At the very, right as he gets to the rim, it looks like he's doing a karate chop in mid, a karate leg, karate leg kick in midair before he dunks the basketball. And then to top it off, he shatters the glass like Shaq. And all of this coming from that kid from the social network. So definitely outlandish, ridiculous. Didn't need to be in the movie at all, but they added it anyways. Don't think that's ever been in the comics. And now, number two, and the reason that this is number two is because 
it's an animated movie, so we can, they can get away with some of these things. And it's Space Jam, Michael Jordan's stretched out arm to win the game against the Monstars. So, in the movie, these aliens come down, they take the powers of Charles Barkley, Sean Bradley, Sean Bradley, I don't know why, Muggsy Bogues, Patrick Ewing, and they're playing basketball against the Looney Tunes with... If, they, if the Looney Tunes lose, they will be captured and taken to Space Mountain, where they will be <clears throat> slaves for their amusement park. So, yeah, they recruit Michael Jordan. They drag him out of a hole that he's playing golf in with Larry Bird and Bill Murray, for whatever reason. He comes down the rabbit, or I guess, yes, the rabbit hole, and he gets thrown into this Looney Tune land. And for whatever reason, uh, Michael Jordan can complies with the Looney Tune characters and he's now a part of their team. So in the game, it's the last second and Jordan finally realizes after a full game of basketball that he can do whatever he wants because he's in an animated world where there essentially are no rules. So he stretches out his arm about 30 feet while all the monsters grab onto him and he scores the winning hoop. So pretty insane as they come. And, uh, yeah, but that's number two because, like I said, it's a cartoon movie, so we can give them the benefit of the doubt of doing some things that are very illogical and impossible. So, let's, before I go into number one, let's look back. Number five, Like Mike, Little Bow Wow's Dunks. Number four, John Tucker, Must Die. Number three, The Amazing Spider-Man, Peter Parker's Dunk over Flash Thompson. And number two, Space Jam, Jordan's Outstretched Arm to win the game. And lastly, American History X, Edward Norton's reverse dunk. So we're going to start with the fact that Edward Norton can barely dribble and he's wearing jorts. So I don't know who was the costume designer on that movie, but not a good look. Who let him wear those? And what are those? And the biggest point of emphasis here is why does Edward Norton have to do a reverse dunk? Like, this isn't some sort of children or fantasy movie. This is a hardcore movie about white supremacist groups in Venice Beach. Why does this guy need to have them this unbelievable dunk? It makes no sense at all. Like, this basketball scene, yeah, I guess it is a big part of the movie because this is what leads to the, guy, the black players from the opposing team. So... Let me go back a step. So it's white, white players versus black players with the rights to the court. Whoever loses can never come back to these Venice Beach basketball courts ever again. Edward Norton's character is a skinhead, uh, racist piece of shit. He leads the team back. He ends the game by stealing the ball and doing a reverse dunk, which, again, Edward Norton's 5'9", 5'10", and a ter- not a great basketball player by any means. And uh, so he wins the game, and the next that night, these players come over trying to kill him, trying to shoot him, and Edward Norton's character ends up killing one of the guys and curb stomping him. It is one of the most graphic scenes you will ever see. But the basketball scene in itself, it, as awful as this movie can be in terms of the material and the things that they say, the scene kind of makes me laugh. But it shouldn't because Norton's character and crew are a bunch of racist pieces of shit. But it's just funny seeing Edward Norton barely able to dribble the ball up the court and then re- doing a reverse dunk to win the game. Again, completely unnecessary. They could have just had him going in for a layup, but instead they want to make it way more exciting and have him do a incredible reverse dunk. So there you have it. That is Nick's picks for this week. Again, like Mike, Little Bow Wow's Dunks, John Tucker Must Die, the entire movie. Number three, The Amazing Spider-Man, Peter Parker's Dunk Over Flash Thompson. Number two, Space Jam, Jordan's Outstretched Arm to Win the Game. And lastly, American History X, Edward Norton's Reverse Dunk to Win the Basketball Game. And that's all we have today, folks. For any of you that have not watched any of these movies, I highly recommend, especially American History X. It is one of the most underrated and best movies from last century. And it has an amazing moral ending to the entire... And 
honestly very relatable to what's going on right now with America. So highly recommend Edward Norton and actually the guy who wrote the original screenplay wrote it in my fraternity house. I mean, 20 years prior to when I was there, but he wrote the original screenplay. He's a fellow brother of mine. So shout out there. But yes, enjoy your weekend. And as always, thank you for listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. As always, please subscribe. Leave a review if you'd like. Helps me out. Helps us out. And also, if you can, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a great night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program